All right, welcome to our evening edition of the Race and Ethnicity Conference, everybody. Um, I get the distinct honor of introducing Professor Keith St. Clair, who's going to be giving the talk tonight on uh, race and politics in Brazil. Uh, Keith took his degrees from Illinois State University, um, which we won't hold against him. But, uh, <laughs> he did. And uh, an interesting thing when looking over his, his, uh, his resume was he's got degrees in both sociology and political science, which is kind of an unusual mix from what I've seen, which um, it's really actually refreshing to see somebody who's actually able to put a lot of that, that social bent on, on political um, patterns and that kind of stuff. So I'm looking forward to what the talk's going to be. Uh, Keith has extensive teaching experience all throughout the Midwest. Um, so he's, um, he's been very familiar with um, not just teaching in various venues, but also interacting with students in, in a variety of contexts. Um, he's a very active member of the World Affairs Council here in Grand Rapids, um, which, is, which keeps him plugged into to different political trends within the world. Um, as well, and he's a regular contributor to various uh, TV commentaries. So Keith is, is quite often uh, plugged by uh, various uh, news outlets here in, in, uh, in the Grand Rapids area to, to give commentary on, on any sort of, of uh, emerging political events in the world. So uh, we have the distinct pleasure of, of having somebody that does have a sort of a pulse beat on, on the world political landscape, which is, is excellent. Um, so at, without further ado, I will turn it over to Keith. Thanks, Dylan. And thank you all for uh, coming tonight uh, for what uh, I think is working out to be a, a very good conference hosted by the uh, Social Science Department at Grand Rapids Community College. Uh, I had the opportunity to go to Brazil in 2005, so a lot of the, the slides that I'm going to show you are from, uh, from that year. Um, and race is very important to the history of Brazil. Um, and I felt like uh, when I was in Brazil that America uh, there was a lot of parallels, but also some important differences. And I think the United States has something to learn from the experience of Brazil that are handling race a little bit differently than how we handle it in the United States. Um, you probably know that Brazil was founded as a Portuguese colony. Uh, the country of Portugal, I think, came across Brazil rather than by, by accident, but uh, upon doing so, uh, established a colony at what is now known as Salvador. And uh, at, that was Brazil's first capital. And although most of South America uh, ended up falling under the Spanish <laughs> Empire, uh, Brazil became part of uh, the Portuguese Empire. And so if you go to Brazil, Portuguese is the dominant language. And if you understand Portuguese, you should be able to do quite well. Um, Brazil in South America, uh, in the Americas, was a nation uh, of immigrants, much like the United States. Um, and although it was settled by Portuguese Europeans in many ways, uh, the, the settlement, uh, as far as the, the number of people that they brought to this uh, part of the world, was not, I don't, I, think, I don't think, as extensive as the English, which, and they certainly didn't bring as many women. So there was a lot of interbreeding with the indigenous people, the Native uh, Americans that lived in Brazil, and also the slaves that the Portuguese brought with them. This is the flag of Brazil, and uh, on it you have uh, kind of the, a representat representation of the green of the Amazon, the gold uh, that was discovered in Brazil that led to another large influx of Europeans, and uh, you've got the southern uh, night sky and order and in, in prog and prog progress, order and progress if you translate that into English. And, um, and so Brazil sees itself as uh, creating a society that was very progressive in its orientation, uh, in orientation of uh, 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 the positivist uh, uh, strand of social science was implemented where they, uh, they believed that social science could create a better society and they felt that the Brazil would be that better society. Uh, in the 19th century, and so that was important to the history of Brazil. Here you have a map of Brazil showing you the various states. Um, and Salvador is up here in, uh, where is it? Bahia, which is one of the larger states. And, uh, but now the capital has moved to Brasilia. It, was, it started with Salvador, it moved down to Rio de Janeiro and then eventually uh, the Federal District of Brasilia, uh, much like our um, District of Columbia, was created to be, to be the capital of this, of this new society, this new state. 
but the settlements of Brazil started here. And this is the really first, this is the first fort. This is Salvador, the, the fort of Salvador that the Portuguese founded. It's still there. The city eventually sprung up around it. Um, and it's now been made into a lighthouse. And through this port was brought many Africans, uh, which would end up being um, brought over to work uh, the sugar cane plantations with sugar, which would be uh, becoming immensely important to, as a, for Brazil as a colony. And about, uh, about half the Africans that were brought over to the Americas went to Brazil. So really, the scale of slavery in Brazil really dwarfs that experience in the United States. You know, far more slaves were brought to Brazil than ever came to the United States. And the, the no reasons for that, I think, are numerous. Number one, Brazil is much closer to Africa, so it was much cheaper uh, to transport the slaves there than up north. And uh, it also made slavery, I'm afraid, more cruel in Brazil, where uh, the Brazilians even did less to take care of their slaves, knowing that once they died, they could easily replace one from Africa, which was so close uh, nearby. Uh, this is the um, Pelerino area of Salvador. Uh, many slaves were bought and sold uh, along this street. And you can see the ancient European architecture uh, with uh, the Catholic Church in the background. Of the slaves that were brought to Africa, and they brought them from all over because they didn't really want African slaves being able to easily communicate uh, with each other. Um, the slaves themselves uh, were not allowed to were not um, were not allowed to teach themselves how to fight or uh, practice martial arts, but they ended up developing one anyway, which now in Brazil is referred to as capoeira. And uh, these capo capoeira fighters still carry on the traditions that the African slaves uh, use, the martial arts that they practice, and they practiced it in the form of a dance uh, when the, the the slave masters were coming around to see what was going on. Uh, amongst the collective of, uh, of Africans um, so as to show that they are not practicing any kind of uh, you know, combat training, they would, in fact, uh, turn it into a dance. And so capoeira is a, is a, um, is a rather interesting choreographed uh, dance martial art that, uh, that is done to music. They still practice it. And, um, and here you see an example of that. Uh, Bahia is the, is the state that Salvador is in, and uh, with it are many uh, traditions. The, uh, uh, you, you receive this, this uh, uh, I guess it's superstition, I guess, but basically the idea is you receive this uh, uh, wristband, and it's, you just let it wear off, and it's supposed to be good luck for you. And um, I think this is part of what um, has become known as candomblé. Candomblé is a syncretic faith that really sprung, sprung up in the uh, the African slaves, amongst the African slaves, and it, it was, uh, it ended up becoming a combination of traditional African religions and faith and worship of African gods with predominantly Catholicism. And we've seen this happen throughout the Americas. We've seen uh, Santeria spring up in Cuba, voodoo in uh, Haiti, and all of these being very similar face in that they were um, a blending of African traditional religion with Catholicism. And so the various African gods, whether we're talking about voodoo, uh, which is, you can see <laughs> practitioners even in Louisiana today, uh, much of it coming from Haiti, but Santeria in Cuba and Candomblé in Brazil, all of them uh, Catholic saints having taken on the persona of various African gods, what they, what they call Orishas. And this is a candomblé temple um, where you would have kind of a uh, candomblé uh, a priest or priestess in there um, performing the rituals necessary uh, to appease the gods and bring good fortune for those who believe. Now, when I've been to New Orleans, I've taken a voodoo tour there, and it's much the same. I mean, many. Uh, it's very hard to distinguish sometimes the difference between 
uh, those who practice these, the syncretic faith and those who practice maybe traditional Catholicism, because like I said, the Catholic, the Catholic saints have kind of taken on the personas of these various African gods. Uh, and as it was explained to me in New Orleans that many, many practitioners of voodoo don't, uh, maybe not even consider themselves practitioners of voodoo. They may just see that as just their, their form of Catholicism, for example. So you really get all, all types, those who see it as distinct, those who see it as their traditional Catholic practice, even if the Catholic Church itself doesn't recognize it. Brazil itself is the largest Catholic country on the planet. Uh, so Catholicism is very important in Brazil, Portugal being a, uh, a Catholic country, and as part of its colonization of its empire, dedicated to spreading the Catholic faith uh, as part of the justification for its empire. And they certainly proceeded to do that in, in the areas of Africa that Portugal colonized, but also in the Americas, and even uh, converting many of the Native Americans to that faith. But in the case of the, many of the African slaves adopting um, uh, you know, the form of Catholicism without while maintaining the substance of many of their African traditions and African gods. Here you have um, uh, one of those African gods. And this, is, this was a panel, wood panel, that was carved, showing you many of the Eurishas or African gods that were represented. And this one is uh, Babaluaye. And, um, and this one stuck out in my mind, because he's, he's kind of the god of pestilence. He's got... Uh, um, what looks like smallpox on his legs, and uh, if you were to ward off diseases, this would be one that you would appeal to. And it stuck out for me because I, well, I, I'm probably dating myself. I'm not sure any of you have ever watched uh, I Love Lucy, uh, Ricky Ricardo, the character in I Love Lucy, and Lucille Ball, who played in that. But, um, you know, Desi Arnaz, who played Ricky Ricardo, he was, in fact, Cuban. And uh, he was a Cuban band leader, and he, and he, uh, um, and he had a, a very popular song. It was called Babalu. And, he, and the background of that song is basically he brought from Cuba the Santeria uh, tradition. Basically, uh, the Africans would, would appeal to their gods, um, the African slaves, by basically pounding out syncopated rhythms on their drums. And depending on the rhythm, that would call down a different god. And so uh, Desi Arnaz, when he's singing his hit song, Babalu, uh, he's basically calling down the African god to the syncopated rhythm that he's beating out on the, uh, the conga drums. And so even though this was a very popular song in the United States, I don't know, back in the 30s, whenever, but I'm, not, I'm sure most Americans didn't realize the, the African background to, to that song. And yet, even to this day, as in Candomblé in Brazil, those drum beats, those syncopated rhythms, are still uh, continued and part of the, uh, the rituals. And this is a, um, a group of children. It's co they're called Oladum. This is a, uh, a nonprofit that's trying to educate uh, youth in African rhythms to give them uh, an appreciation of the arts, appreciation of music, uh, it's taking basically street kids, kids who are, who are um, growing up in poverty, and giving them something constructive to do, as opposed to uh, falling in with gangs and crime and that sort of thing. And uh, if any of you are Paul Simon fans, the, the, if you've got the, the CD Rhythm of the Saints, you know, he makes much use of that. He even teamed up with this group on some of the songs on that album. Um, and they demonstrated that force with their, their drum line. Samba, uh, another type of music, maybe some of you are familiar with that. Uh, it's very, very uh, um, popular in Brazil. It comes from Brazil. And in many ways, this kind of represented a coming of age for African culture in Brazil. Uh, slavery, well, Brazil was rather late. It was probably the latest country that I know of to give up slavery. We're talking 1888, 1889. long after the American Civil War, 1865, when Americans finally um, gave up the institution of slavery. 
So Brazil, in that sense, was behind us. And there's also an interesting connection there, as a matter of fact, because as we, uh, as slavery was given up in the United States, and as the South lost the Civil War that precipitated that, there were a lot of Southerners who weren't satisfied and were willing to give up their slaves. And some of these Southerners, these Confederate soldiers, they took their slaves to Brazil, where they became known as Confederados. And they established uh, numerous uh, cities, one of which uh, remains called Americana in the state of Sao Paulo. And, uh, and they lived there for generations, speaking, uh, refusing to adopt the Portuguese language for many generations, sticking to their English, and uh, many, and f and they've now since, of course, uh, assimilated. Uh, so even the people there now know Portuguese, but many of the street names are in English in those, little, in those communities. And it was about, I think, 4,000 original Confederate soldiers that settled in Brazil with their slaves, and those communities are still there. Um, now, eventually, Brazil would give up slavery itself um, by 1888, and, uh, and some, of the, some of those Confederates would then uh, return back to the United States. But many of them stayed. And so there's even, you know, there's even kind of an American settlement of Brazil that's, that's rather interesting in that respect. You know, many people settled Brazil from all over the world, even though the Portuguese dominated and their language dominated because of it, but Germans, Italians would be all encouraged. Um, Brazil remained a, a, a kingdom because the, uh, the Portuguese king fled to Brazil during the Napoleonic Wars. And he remained in exile in Brazil. And it was really until uh, the Napoleonic Wars ended in 1815, and it was around 1820, that, uh, with the, the, that the Portuguese uh, constitutional parliament that was created asked that the king return. And uh, the king did so, but his son remained, uh, Pedro, and he ended up becoming and declaring his independence, making Brazil one of the few kingdoms in the New World. And so uh, when Brazil declared its independence around 1822, 1823, Brazil became a kingdom. And it remained a monarchy up until right after uh, slavery was ended. In fact, it was uh, Pedro II's daughter, Isabella, who actually uh, serving as regent while her, uh, her father was away that, uh, that actually passed the law that did away with slavery. Upon doing so, it was kind of the king's, the, the monarchy's undoing in that much of the support for the monarchy was um, coming from the, land, the, the, uh, the landed aristocracy in Brazil. And yet the new rising class was the, ca the capitalist, uh, industrialist. And um, with uh, the king and the uh, monarchy doing away with slavery, well then, they, he really lost the support of uh, the landed aristocracy, and um, there was, in, ens in essence, a, an overthrow of, uh, of the monarchy in 1889, and Brazil then became a republic and has remained a republic ever since. A republic that has basically uh, functioned as uh, a dictatorship in many ways, um, basically, a, pres a, a, a rotating presidency was established, and two of the major states of Brazil kind of ended up dominating the politics, taking terms as, as far as uh, a representative from their state serving as president. And that lasted really all the way up until the 1830s, eight, about 1830, when um, someone who wasn't supposed to win the presidency won it, uh, Getulio Vargas. And Vargas is kind of the, um, uh, the Perón, uh, you know, Perón being the, the, the popular dictator of Argentina about that same time period. Vargas was kind of the popular dictator uh, of Brazil. He won the election um, and, and really was beloved by his people for a long period of time. And he really kind of changed the traje trajectory of race in, in Brazil in some respects because ever since slavery ended in Brazil, the whites who were dominant politically wanted to de-Africanize Brazil. Despite all the Africans that were brought here, all the former slaves that were now freed, um, they didn't want that to be the future of Brazil. And so with the ending of slavery in 1888, there was a conscious effort in the late 19th century 
by the whites of Brazil to de-Africanize Brazil by bringing and encouraging your more European immigration. And so after that time period, you get a huge influx of Italians, Germans, and uh, any whites that were willing to come, the government of Brazil was more than welcome that they come in the hopes that uh, they would uh, uh, balance out the population vis-a-vis -vis the Africans. And to the extent that they interbred, that it would whiten the population. Well, this also meant that anything culturally African was also looked at as less than and was de-emphasized by the society. So uh, it really took the coming of Getulio Vargas in 1930 to really change that, where he at least uh, was popular amongst the common man, the poor folk of Brazil. And he did things like uh, you know, create a minimum wage, and uh, he established a union movement, um, workers' rights. And as part of his appeal to the, to the common man, uh, I think he appreciated uh, the culture of the common man. And that would include some of the African imports, such as um, samba. And so he's, he was able to uh, get the people and the society of Brazil to embrace parts of its African culture that it hadn't up until that po point in time. And so you get the popularization of music like samba and, uh, um, and, and, and some other aspects, and candomblé, and, and really um, carnival. Which up until that time was kind of looked down on as kind of uh, a little too African with its ritual. Uh, uh, it, certainly, it has uh, it, its uh, its its aspects of Catholicism in that it's being the celebrations before Lent. But at the same time, you had Candomblé assuming a lot of those those Catholic traditions and uh, intermingling African dance, African rituals, and African celebrations. And so, Carnival kind of came out of that. African tradition as well. So with the coming of Getulio Vargas as president, you see him not only elevating African cultural aspects like samba, but also the carnival. And, and so it becomes, uh, it becomes acceptable all of a sudden for even upper class whites to partake in those types of celebrations. And even today, um, much of the well, if you know, if you know, kind of the tradition of Mardi Gras and the Carnival, it's really kind of the world turned upside down. It's really uh, the celebration of chaos before order. I mean, um, uh, it's a time of revelry before, uh, you know, um, what's the word? Uh, kind of a, a stoic existence of giving up and sacrifice. And in some ways, it's uh, the you know, the bottom ends up being placed on top. And so the lowest of the low is kind of made king for a day. And you have, uh, during the carnival celebrations, you have these various floats. Many of the floats are created by the various slum uh, neighborhoods in Brazil. Uh, the poor people building these floats, some of the poor people actually being on these floats as the actors. And they are the ones who are cheered in the streets as the, as the floats go by. So it really is kind of the bottom of society being placed up on top, and the, uh, the lowest of the low may being made king for a day. And so, um, and so there's that, that tradition. So I, you have a, I haven't had a chance myself to celebrate Carnival down there, but I mean, I would certainly uh, uh, recommend it. So with the coming of Vargas, you get kind of Brazil accepting much of its African culture, but at the same time not necessarily accepting uh, the uh, Afro-Brazilians or, or black Brazilians. I mean, in other words, color still matters, race still matters. They, uh, the Brazilian society during the, you know, the uh, mid-20th century, and Vargas's uh, tenure in, as president would last until really roughly the end of World War II. And really, Brazil's declaration of war on Nazi Germany kind of played a role 
in, that, uh, in, the, in the race relations in Brazil because, after all, they were fighting the Nazis along with the United States. And just as in the United States, it looked very hypocritical for us to be fighting a, a, a Nazi ideology that was so racist in orientation and at the same time continued to express the racism of segregation in the southern United States where blacks had separate waiting rooms, drinking fountains, the same thing in Brazil. So uh, it, it, it created the uh, kind of a guilt that, that society needed to be more open and more accepting of racial differences. And then, so Brazil adopted what it thought was kind of a, um, a racial democracy that it promoted to the rest of the world. That uh, in many ways they saw themselves in that respect superior to even the United States where the United, southern United States had very strict segregation laws. Black drinking fountains, white drinking fountains. Black restrooms, white restrooms. In Brazil, they didn't have that. They didn't have that, those overt, segregated society by law. Uh, in fact, Brazil was always very integrated, perhaps because there was such a large portion of its population that was black of, or of black ancestry. And so maybe it was, maybe it was more uh, less practical or to try to separate as overtly as it was done in the southern United States. So Brazil, because it didn't have that forced segregation and because blacks and whites lived amongst each other in close proximity and the society was very integrated as opposed to segregated, Brazil could in many ways attempt to fool itself that it was this uh, racial democracy, this brave new world. And yet it was kind of a myth because throughout the 20th century, race still mattered. As if, and, and I think one thing I've, uh, I think I've come to learn is that race always matters. People don't know, ignore each other's skin color any more than they ignore each other's gender. Right? And you don't treat men and women the same. I've seen that first. I mean, you, you can have a group of men, no women. One woman enters the room, conversation changes, topics change. Right? We don't treat gender the same. We don't treat people's skin color the same. And in some ways, if you're not, if you're not aware of that, if you're not conscious of that, and sometimes it's, a, it's appropriate. You know, I might, you know, I might refer to a white man as a boy in a kidding way. I would, I would never call a black man a boy, aware of the historical connotations associated with that, given my race, their race. You can't, you can't ignore the, histori the history there. You better be aware of it. So in Brazil, it's really not much different. The, they believed that race didn't matter. They promoted themselves as a racial democracy where they had a post-racial society, as the term that I'm hearing now in the United States, since the elect election of President Barack Obama. But the reality is, it, it was not and it is not. Uh, race, unfortunately, still matters in Brazil. And Brazil is now coming to terms with that reality. Nevertheless, you've got a tremendous mixing in Brazilian society. And this, kind of, this chart kind of shows you how people self-identify out of a population of maybe, what, 180 million. Um, you have most people identifying as white, but even, I would argue, many of them having some black or even Native American ancestry. A large percentage of the population, or not a percentage here, this is 65 million, that's not a percent, but 65 million people self-identifying as mixed. So acknowledging the fact that they are of mixed race, of various hues, and then about 10 million who see themselves as, uh, as really black African, Afro-Brazilian. <laughs> The indigenous would be uh, those identifying as Native Americans, relatively small in number, according to the population, and then, of course, those undeclared. And, of course, Asians as well. Because, as I said, 
Uh, race in Brazil is not just a black-white uh, uh, dichotomy. It's also uh, it's a, it's a society that's taken immigrants from all over the world, including Asia, uh, Chinese, Japanese. This is Japantown in Sao Paulo. Uh, many Japanese uh, not only immigrated to the United States, but also to Brazil and also to Peru. Um, in fact, in the case of Peru, some of these Japanese, uh, Japanese Peruvians, I guess is maybe the right term, some of them have gone back to Japan and uh, they've kind of been shunned by their, their uh, traditional Japanese in Japan as being now outsiders and uh, um, as no longer truly Japanese coming back with kind of foreign ways, so to speak. There's a Tory gate there in Japantown. This picture shows you the, the various complexions of Brazilians. And, and uh, um, I mean, you've got, you've got many people that would appear from most Americans' standpoint to be very white and, and black, and then you've got everything in between. Um, Certainly we have that here in the United States, but it's even more prevalent and more varied in Brazil given the larger influx of uh, Africans. Remember I said almost half the Africans that were brought to the New World as slaves, almost half of them went to Brazil, one country alone. So far more than ever came to the United States. And fewer whites. More examples of Brazilians. And race is very much related to poverty in Brazil. I mean, when I was there, I was told that poverty has a color in Brazil, and that color is black. The vast proportion of blacks are poor. Uh, and that's not to say that there aren't poor whites as well, but it's an overwhelming amount of poor who are black. And the, many of the whites uh, have had pr privileges that they have not, economic, political privileges. And this is actually a university in Brazil, and education certainly reflects that. And that in, in in a more recent way is one way that Brazil is trying to get a handle on um, the racial problems and the racial disparities that exist in its society. Um, the educational system in and of itself is not very good. Uh, if, you, if you're talking about the K through 12 primary and secondary schools, you would definitely want to go to a private school if you could. Uh, they have you would much increase your chances of going to university. At the university at college level, however, uh, the state universities, the state colleges, the public colleges are more prestigious than the private ones. And that's because they receive a lot of state funding in Brazil and traditionally very selective in who they let in. So many of the whites uh, who are of privilege, who go to a private primary and secondary school, would have an advantage in getting into university. And so there has been an underrepresentation of uh, non-whites in the colleges. So Brazil, for a long time, just ignored that problem. Because after all, they kept telling themselves they're a racial democracy. Race doesn't matter in Brazil. We're completely integrated. We don't have segregation. But nevertheless, uh, the economic opportunities were better for whites. You know, they talk about uh, um, you know people in ads as being of, of good appearance. I mean, it's also been said that um, that money whitens in Brazil. That uh, if you, I guess, if you're rich. Uh, even if you're black, uh, you can be accepted. The more money you have, but the less, the, the less 
white you are, the less likely you are going to have to grow up with those opportunities. And so Brazil has had to come to accept that and deal with it. And they have adopted something like affirmative action, but even more extensive. I mean, we have affirmative action in the United States where uh, meant to give minorities of, uh, of various uh, race and ethnicities uh, a leg up as far as getting them in the applicant pools, whether we're talking about admission to universities, whether we're talking about hiring for a job. It's not supposed to guarantee them a job because for the most part in the United States, quotas are illegal. The only time a quota is allowed, a numerical uh, amount uh, would be if a court has ordered it. Generally, the U.S. courts have frowned on quotas. You can't set aside, generally, uh, even this college, for example, we can't say, well, we're going we're to set aside 10 spots that have to go to blacks, or 10 spots that have to go to Hispanics. That is generally illegal in the United States. You can't do that. You can have affirmative action, where you kind of go out of your way to make sure that minorities are included in the applicant pool, but once they're in the applicant pool, they've got to win the job on their own. You can't set aside a spot and say, we're going, to only hire, we're going to hire 10 women, 15 blacks, and 20 Hispanics. All right, that would be absolutely illegal in the United States. The only way that would ever be allowed is if a court has ordered that to specifically remedy uh, a past egregious example of, uh, uh, of discrimination. And those are quite rare. For the most part, we don't have quotas. Well, Brazil has taken our affirmative action a step further and actually has adopted quotas, at least with regards to admission to universities, where spots are specifically set aside for non-whites. And given the various complexions of most Brazilians, this has been problematic in its own way, because what it has meant is that when you submit an application to some of these state universities in the hopes of receiving one of these spots for non-whites, uh, you send in a picture. And there's a committee that actually reviews the photo to see just how black you are or how not black you are and whether you therefore deserve the quota slot. Right. And given the various complexities, we know that sometimes there's gray area. It's not, people aren't just black and white. They're everything in between. And so there's been an enormous amount of controversy uh, regarding about how those selections and decisions are actually made. All right, so um, what else can I say about it? here? I, I, there's also kind of a north-south divide in that respect. This is closer to the equator. So the equator, I believe, goes through here. And this is the Amazon rainforest. Um, but in here, there was a lot of f land that was cleared for farming. And we, we all, or I'll talk a little bit later about how much of the Amazon is being, has been cleared for farming. But, uh, Bahia was a, a, a great example of a state where, uh, where uh, sugarcane uh, was a crop that was used. The Africans were meant to harvest that, that crop. It was very hard work, very hard labor that, uh, that they were put to the task. And the further you go south now, away from the equator, the more moderate the climate. And there were fewer slaves that were brought down here. In fact, far more white Europeans migrated to this area. So in some ways, it's kind of uh, the inverse of the United States, where many of the blacks were brought to the southern United States, and the north didn't have quite so many uh, Africans. In Brazil, it's kind of just the opposite. The north was far more um, African slave migration, and the south was more white. And so you have today. For example, the states of Parana, Santa Catarina, and Rio de Grande de Sol that, um, that are very affluent, very white, very European in their ancestry, and they kind of resent uh, migrations from the poor uh, north and also what they might see um, as Afro-Brazilians coming south. And there's actually been a movement as racist as it is, 
for them to secede from the Brazil and form their own country. As the farther you go north, the more poverty there is, and in these states, uh, much more affluence. You can kind of see that represented here in the colors, GDP per person. Now, Brasilia benefits because it's the capital, and so it receives a lot of federal money. This is the state of Sao Paulo. So Sao Paulo, one of the, the largest cities, not only in Brazil, but also the world, is in the state of Sao Paulo. And uh, this was one of the first settlements here. This was, uh, 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 I believe, a Jesuit missionary uh, mission. This is Sao Paulo today, and you can see how it's grown. And it, is, it is a huge metropolis, kind of the equivalent of New York City for Brazil. And again, representing people from all over the world who have migrated here, very cosmopolitan in its orientation. And some of the city, very wealthy. And like many of the cities in Brazil, you have, uh, you have slums springing up on the outside, but in much of the city center, you have an enormous amount of wealth. It's a huge disparity of wealth in Brazil. These are some of the poor areas, what are called the slums. This one happens to be outside Rio de Janeiro, but these are what they call in Brazil favelas. A favela was like a, a, a leaf that the, uh, uh, and I guess the, the analogy is, is that these poor slums kind of fold around the cities like a leaf. And so they, they've acquired that term. And in the case of Rio de Janeiro, the slums and shanty towns ride up on the high ground overlooking the city because it's very hilly. And they build these slums throughout Brazil. I mean, they're shanty towns, m meaning that just in some cases they might be just a lean to. Obviously, here you have some sort of construction, but it's not necessarily up to code. It's not necessarily safe. It's not necessarily, uh, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's whatever they can use to build any kind of shelter for themselves. And the whole intent is for these people to to establish an af something that they can afford to live outside the major cities so that they can avail themselves of the economic opportunities that the cities provide. Right? Because the cities, it's in the cities that you're more likely to have access to health care. It's, it's in the cities that you're more likely to have access to a job, uh, and a better paying job at that. And that, of course, uh, this disparity in wealth leads to the large crime rate that exists in Brazil. Uh, the, murder, the murder rate in Brazil is quite high. It's more than in the United States. I think it rivals South Africa uh, as far as uh, the number of murders. This is uh, razor wire protecting some of the property of the wealthy from those who have not. Uh, there's a police presence on the street. Uh, the police have uh, unfortunately gained a uh, notoriety throughout the world. Um, and perhaps you've read about some of the death squads that exist in Brazil, where you basically have businesses who have hired police, off duty police officers, or in same, some cases encouraged the on duty police officers to basically clear the streets and uh, the business area of, of people, undesirables. Uh, homeless people, street kids, uh, many of the uh, kids living on the street who sniff glue uh, and just kind of beg for money and, or steal um, in order to stay high. Uh, these, these death squads, basically these, these police officers in some cases have just gone out and just killed these uh, uh, youths on the street. and. Um, and there was one notable instance where in Rio de Janeiro, I think in one day, there was I think 30 of them killed. And this became a huge international scandal. The police are, have an unfortunate reputation of killing a lot of people anyway. I think in, the, uh, in uh, Rio de Janeiro, they killed, uh, the state police killed about 1,000 people in 2005. 
when I was in Rio de Janeiro, I actually even heard the, the gunshots. In fact, I was, it, felt like it was machine gun fire, really. I thought it was fireworks, and I asked people, uh, was there a celebration going on? And they're like, no, that's, that's the police firing into the favelas. And the favelas were just not that far from the beach. Um, the police do not run the favelas. The favelas are run by organized crime. The, fa the, the, the poor run the favelas. And they do frequent battles with the police for control of, uh, of all, for drug territory, for example. And yet, Rio de Janeiro is a very popular tourist, tourist destination for very good reason. Uh, here you see uh, uh, Rio. Uh, here you have Sugarloaf, uh, Corcovado, uh, Rio de Janeiro. And the climate is beautiful. Uh, the beaches are beautiful. Uh, this is the tram going up to Sugarloaf. This is looking back on Corcovado with the uh, uh, the Statue of Christ overlooking the city of Rio de Janeiro. That's a close-up view of it. And this is uh, downtown Rio. And although I mentioned Carnival earlier, remember, do note that Carnival is not just celebrated in Rio, but it's celebrated throughout Brazil. But Rio probably has the most famous celebration of Carnival. This is the uh, Petrobras uh, building. This is the, the state oil company. And Brazil does have a lot of oil now. Um, it's actually been self-sufficient in oil for some time because uh, Brazil invested heavily in ethanol, uh, making their ethanol with uh, sugar cane. And, um, which is far more efficient than it is making it with corn, which is what we use. But because of uh, American corn farmers, uh, I mean, we grow a lot of corn, but we don't grow a lot, uh, as much sugar cane. <coughs> so American eth uh, ethanol, um, is, uh, the corn suppliers are very subsidized by the US government. It would actually be cheaper for us to buy Brazilian ethanol, but. Um, the U.S. government doesn't, and, and American corn producers don't want to see that happen. So Brazil, because of the oil shock in the 1970s, became uh, very aware of its, um, its, of its need for oil, and they ended up investing heavily in ethanol. And uh, many of their cars run on both ethanol and gasoline, or any mixture in between. And, uh, and yet now Brazil has discovered huge oil uh, reserves in the Atlantic Ocean off its coast. And, is going to be, a, it looks like, a major oil exporter into the next century. So they really kind of have, are sitting pretty as far as that goes. Anyway, uh, the beautiful beaches. This is Ipanema Beach. There's a girl from Ipanema there. Um, surfing. So not only do you have uh, wealthy Brazilians enjoying that, but you also have uh, tourists coming from all over the world to enjoy that. And of course, there's the famous Iguazu Falls on the border with Argentina, also a very dear tourist attraction. And it really kind of, um, it really kind of put Niagara Falls to shame, really. All right, so you have, you have tourist dollars, you have Brazilians who are wealthy, who are able to enjoy uh, the, you know, the, what, all that Brazil has to offer. The, um, but then you have those who do not. And that has led to, in Brazil, what is known as the, uh, uh, the landless workers movement. And this is a camp, uh, a squatters camp that has been established by the landless workers. Basically, these are people from the cities, the urban cities, who have struck out into the countryside and rural areas of Brazil to find a piece of land for themselves that they can uh, develop, maybe farm, uh, create a life for themselves, economic opportunities uh, that they don't necessarily maybe have in the city. And so these migrants, of course, they don't have money to pay for the land. <laughs> 
So they squat on it. Basically, they find a piece of land, and they stake a claim, and yet the land is already owned by someone, usually a corporation. And in this case, it was the water company. And uh, the Brazilian, uh, the people from the cities have come here with the intent of actually taking this land, taking it for themselves. Uh, the, the company, the water company obviously sees it as stealing their land, taking it without compensation. And uh, you've had these standoffs throughout Brazil. It's hard for us to imagine, but for those of you who have American history, I'm sure your professors can tell you about the, the squatter camps that existed in the United States and in the Great Depression, and how even in D.C. they were cleared out um, and destroyed. But uh, this doesn't seem like something that would ever be tolerated in the United States, and yet the U.S., the Brazilian government has had to deal with it. In some cases, the police and government authorities have come in and done just what we've seen happen in the United States. They just cleared them out. They destroyed their camps. They arrest or run them off the land. And in some cases, maybe even kill them. Uh, or, as sometimes happens, uh, the public backlash, the bad publicity, the persistence of the squatters has led to some sort of accommodation or negotiated settlement resulting in the squatters actually receiving the permanent right to own that land and to use it. Now these squatter, this squatter camp, I uh, hear you see them rather standing rather defiantly for my photograph, uh, they believed that they were going to be successful as the government had agreed to be an intermediary between them and the water company whose land they were sitting on. Uh, and the government agreed to kind of uh, mediate for them. And they believed that the government was going to do what it had occasionally done before, where the government might even agree to buy the land from the water company in order to give it to the squatters, in order to reduce the, uh, uh, the likelihood of violence, to prevent uh, possible uh, people from being killed. This is their camp, and uh, it's <laughs> rather rustic. You mean basically uh, you've got plastic uh, sheeting for the walls of their, uh, of their homes. Um, there you can see the, uh, Basically, their, their farming plot, basically with the growing uh, flowers and fruits and vegetables that they hoped to sell to the favela that was nearby. Now, this particular camp was called uh, uh, um, the Sister Alberta camp, but it was run by um, their leader was a Catholic nun. And the Catholic Church has been a champion uh, of, the, of the poor in Brazil. Even when Brazil was ruled by military dictators in the 70s and 80s. And that's because the one area that the dictatorship was reluctant to really uh, impose too, too much of its power over was the Catholic Church. And so the Catholic Church became like a shield, uh, uh, a sanctuary for those who were opposing the government. Much like the Catholic Church served in Poland against the communist government in the 1980s. And much like the, uh, the mosque in, in Muslim mosque in Iran served under the Shah's rule prior to the Shah's overthrow in 1979. Now, again, that was the one, the one institution he was reluctant to really uh, pressure too much was uh, the mosque, the church, the, the imams. So we've seen this kind of play out time and time again, and it, it certainly has played out that way in the case of Brazil. So you have Sister Maria uh, being the leader of this camp, and perhaps that also gives them a little bit uh, of empathy by the larger population. I mean, after all, be, I guess it'd be, uh, I mean, it's one thing to kill these people and run them off their land, it's another to do it if there's uh, nuns involved. But uh, Sister Maria, who runs this camp, has actually encouraged many to come from the cities 
who have uh, many of the former, many, some of them former prostitutes, some of them former drug addicts, but uh, many of them HIV positive. And so uh, she, to many, in, in their eyes, these are people who have, many of them have nothing to lose. And, um, and so she's kind of taken them under their wing and kind of organized their uh, productivity. And here she is, this is Sister Maria. Obviously representing the Asian immigration that I was talking about in Brazil uh, in the past. This is a, an outhouse, so they don't have the indoor plumbing. Uh, it's just what they've been able to cobble together. Well, they did, were able to buy this nice stove, though, which uh, I guess run on uh, gas. And they were quite proud to show that off. Well, this is the Amazon. Um, and it's really where the Amazon is that the, the, what remains of the Native American population mostly resides. They don't all live in the Amazon, but that's where you find a lot of them. And, and, and obviously it's been drastically reduced uh, due to uh, mostly disease from whites, but also there's been a lot of um, interbreeding and some assimilation into the larger Brazilian culture. But those Native Americans in Brazil, who stick to their ways and retain their culture and rec retain their identity as Indians, Amer Indians, I guess maybe is the more appropriate term, uh, they are not citizens of Brazil. Unlike in the United States where all Native Americans were eventually given citizenship by the US government, uh, if to retain your Indian status in Brazil is to not be able to vote, uh, but to, to basically live amongst your own in your own society, uh, in your, on your own territory, in, the, in this case in the Amazon rainforest. And yet uh, the Amazon rainforest has been more and more cleared uh, by farmers who want to use it to grow crops or raise, or actually more often to uh, graze cattle. And also by mining companies uh, and lumber companies who want to clear cut the forest. And this is something that the activists and environmentalists in the United States are even alarmed about, given the fact that rainforests are a major producer of oxygen, and they take a lot of CO2 out of the air. Um, and so in that respect, rainforests kind of help in the fight against global warming or the greenhouse effect. Um, so it has become, saving the rainforest in the Amazon is an international cause. And it's really only recently that Brazil has begun to see it as that. I mean, Prior to recently, the Brazil as a government just saw the rainforest as a resource to be exploited, not to be preserved. But they have come around to that way of thinking, albeit rather late. And they're certainly, um, they certainly face uh, political resistance by those uh, miners and um, uh, lumberers who would like, and cattle ranchers who would like to see the rainforest continue to be clear cut. Of course, it's named after the vast Amazon River. And that's also a tourist destination for people. I mean, you can go there, and this is, you can fish for piranha, and um, you can even swim in the Amazon. And the, the piranha don't bother you as, as long as it's not uh, the dry season. If you, uh, what happens is, uh, in the wet season, there's plenty to eat, so the piranha don't attack you. But if you are... Um, if it's the dry season, what often happens is some of the parts of the river will become separated from the larger parts. And uh, those, part, those pools will dry up in the dry season. And the fish will eat everything in those pools that there is to eat. And once that is exhausted, then anything that wanders in, then the piranha will just devour. So really, uh, it, it's really only in the dry season that you might have to worry about where you actually swim. And, and actually, they fish and eat the piranha, actually. You know, for, for a long time, the major resource that the Amazon provided was the, uh, um, uh, the rubber trees. I mean, this is uh, until, the British, uh, until the British transplanted the rubber trees elsewhere, it was really Brazil that you had to go to to get the rubber. And so here you have um, a native Brazilian showing you how to uh, uh, 
cut a tree for the sap necessary to create rubber, and it would, it would drip down the side. And it was amazing how quickly it established a consistency that you would know of, of his rubber. Brazil itself was named, I don't know which came first actually now that I think about it. This is the Brazil tree, Brazil nut. Which you may know as Brazil nuts. They, they kind of called them the equivalent of nigger toes, which is what they used to be called even in the United States, much to my surprise. But even in the Amazon, you find uh, the favelas. So uh, the Native Americans in, in the Amazon are aligning themselves with uh, those who would like to use the, uh, the, the rainforest as a renewable resource. Uh, in that sense, the rubber tappers are a natural ally. The environmentalists are a natural ally. The Native Americans obviously have a vested interest in preserving the rainforest. And they are, um, find themselves opposing the cattle ranchers, the miners, and the loggers. So in sum, Brazil is a very diverse society. It's not just black and white either. It's a society of immigrants from all over the world. It's a society that has a traditional indigenous population and a Native American. And, um, and all of this has come to, uh, uh, about to make a very complex society, uh, one that is very now racially aware of itself and is attempting to do, deal with it in a way that's a little different than in the United States. Um, and I'm, I tend to be optimistic. I, t I tend to, I mean, I certainly loved Brazil. I fell in love with it traveling there. I certainly uh, would encourage any of you to go. I don't think uh, of all of the negative things I mentioned about Brazil, it certainly shouldn't prevent you from going there as a tourist. I think you'd be perfectly fine. Um, you know, you, you, just, you, just, you know where to go and where not to go. Uh, and you could say the same about coming to the United States. I guess with that, I think I'll open it up to questions and see what, what, is, what you would like to ask or focus on that I can address, uh, given what I talked about um, regarding Brazil. Yes, Beth. Yes. I'm not, I, uh, I'm not sure I understand your question. You're saying if someone goes to a private school, <laughs> yeah, you should because uh, this is being recorded. And they won't hear your question unless you speak into the microphone. Uh, you were talking about affirmative action. And I was wondering if the people that were being chosen to do this, if they weren't going to a private school to begin with, like K through 12, are they even going to be able to succeed in a university? In other words, are they being set up for failure? Right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we face that kind of controversy even in the United States. But yeah, in Brazil, to some extent, uh, by having a quota, reserving certain slots for a population uh, that may not necessarily be able to qualify in other respects for those slots, then people who they do accept uh, may not end up, they may not end up dropping out or failing. and. You could are, and you you can then see some of the counter arguments from those uh, non beneficiaries of affirmative action who would say that that is a waste. That is a waste to reserve that s slot for somebody who's not going to succeed is to take it away from somebody who would, even if they aren't in what we would call a minority status. And so yeah, so you are seeing the uh, the con mm -hmm. that controversy play out, and it is resented amongst those who have and who are not the beneficiaries of those affirmative action policies in Brazil. Absolutely. <coughs> and I don't have a resolution for that. I mean, I don't know, I don't know how, you, how you do that. 
Vincent. Um, Microphone, please. Um, you said that the, the police sometimes kill their um, own citizens, right? Yes, that I mean, unfortunately, that has been the case, and and they've been paid to do so. Then, shouldn't like the um, it's not legal. Oh, just making sure. Like, shouldn't there be more like a public outcry against this? There is a public outcry. Yeah, that's more right. Of one, like, shouldn't there be more public knowledge or something? Or? I agree with you, Vince, I, and I had that problem too. I mean, I that was something that baffled me. I mean, there's been an international outcry against it, but I was a little kind of. Uh, Bemused as to why there wasn't more of an outcry amongst Brazilian society. Uh, I, I'm kind of confused about that. Yeah, I'm kind of confused about it as well. And I, to me, it's just kind of a, uh, I don't know what explains it. If, uh, but the wealthy don't have, uh, perhaps, a sense of cultural sense of obligation, perhaps, or that maybe they do in the United States. They're just, they don't care. It is a shame, uh, but I, uh, to me, there is something culturally different because even amongst the DeVosses and Van Andels, I mean, you wouldn't see that kind of acceptance of that behavior. So um, it is rather hard to explain. I don't know. I mean, th that's obviously a cultural difference that I am at a loss to explain. I had the same, I had the same thoughts as you did, Vincent. I, I, I found that appalling. But there should be, I mean, I think there is some public outcry, but there should have been more at the time. Yeah. I think, I think, it's, uh, I think it's changing. I do. I hope it's changing. I was just going to say, it's kind of like, F, like, you know, the places in Iran and whatnot where terrorism happens a lot, but there's not that much of a, at least from what I know, there's not that much of an outcry there in Iran and whatnot. I'm not sure I follow you. Like, There's not an outcry in Iran well, about well, what? Terrorists, you know, how people are dying to them is like an everyday thing or something? Is it like the same that, that kind of situation? How they just gotten used to it or? Uh, no, they haven't gotten used to it in Iran. And in Iran, they do have protests against terrorism. Yeah. I mean, we, we tend to forget that on, after September 11th, there were candlelight vigils uh, in Iran, in Tehran, for the Americans who lost their lives on 9-11. Oh. So, uh, Iran was actually fairly sympathetic, uh, at least the, the people on the streets. Even the Ayatollahs of Iran said a few nice things about the United States uh, following the terrorist attacks. So uh, I'm not sure that the example you're using is the best one. I was just wondering with um, so many, such a large um, number of people identifying as mixed race and as time goes on, um, the races will continue to mix and the population will grow larger. Do you think it, um, that will help more with the assimilation in the country? Well, I yeah, I mean, I guess it is, in a science fiction sense, eventually we'll be all one race, I guess, eventually. I mean, I guess the world is destined for that sooner or later, but I mean, that, that day is a long way off. Uh, certainly not going to happen in my lifetime. It's not going to happen here in the United States. It's not going to happen in Brazil in that time. And uh, I anticipate that um, race will matter till the day I die here and in Brazil. Well, being of mixed race in Brazil, do you think that um, helps or hinders as far as education and um, wealth and poverty situations? Well, I think uh, mixed marriages in general help. I think um, when whites and blacks intermarry, um, I think that denotes understanding, uh, love. Um, I hope most people get married for love, and uh, and that that's all for the good. Um, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm not sure to what extent having children of mixed race solves the problem uh, because it's all relative, isn't it? Yes. I mean, uh, nobody's exact. I, I mean. Few are purely black and purely white. I mean, most people fall somewhere in between, and it's not about, uh, it always seems to be about race. Someone's darker than somebody else. And, the, and with that comes um, assumptions, assumptions of poverty, 
assumptions of lack of education, assumptions of crime. Uh, we experience that sort of race prejudice in the United States. We see it uh, experienced in Brazil. And when you make those assumptions about someone, then uh, when they apply for a job, you're more likely to pass them over. Um, when they apply to a university, you're, you know, you're, you're more likely to assume that they're not qualified. Uh, I mean, those assumptions serve to keep people back. And that is a legitimate grievance for those who suffer from that. And uh, I don't know, and at the same time, I don't know how you do away with that. I mean, we're education, number one. Uh, being aware of the presumptions that you're making <coughs> on people. I mean, I don't think it does any of us any good to uh, pretend that we live in a racial democracy as they refer to it in Brazil or in the United States, uh, a post-racial society, uh, or, uh, uh, or to pretend to be colorblind uh, like uh, Stephen Colbert does on his show. You know, and that the only way he knows he's white is that people tell him. And that the, the why I love that joke so much is that he's making fun of, of, uh, of the many people who say that they do not tra treat people of different races differently. I mean, he's in essence saying that that's absurd. Everybody treats people of different races differently. Uh, that, I think, is the point that he's making. And that point, I agree with. And uh, so, in that sense, even myself, I need to be vigilant and pay attention to what I'm doing so that I don't find myself making assumptions about someone based on the way they look, uh, that's going to serve to hold them back in any way, because that's unfair. But uh, you know, that's why a conference like this one, the Race and Ethnicity Conference that we're holding, that's why that many of the things that you're learning in your social science classes, you know, learning of, about other people of diverse backgrounds and understanding them, I think are the best way of overcoming those natural tendencies and therefore our, our hope for the future. Um, could you explain a little bit about the um, political structure, the um, governmental structure, and um, how that might affect or positively or negatively the diversity that's in Brazil, or lack of diversity? Well, that, that's an interesting point. I mean, in many ways, Brazil has kind of copied our political constitution. I mean, they are a federal system um, made up of what, 26 states. They are, um, you know, they have a president who serves as head of state, head of government. They have, like ours, um, they have a, uh, a bicameral legislature with two chambers like ours. I mean, it's it, basically, the, in many ways, they've copied the form, but because they have a different uh, political cultural tradition descended from the Portuguese as opposed to ours coming from the English, it has played out differently. And as, as some society, many societies in Latin America who have basically copied our Constitution, they find that in copying our Constitution, they don't end up with the same form of government as we do. And the question is, to why? And the, the only explanation in many cases is the, 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 the difference in political culture. You know, many Latin American countries uh, having a, a different uh, traditions coming from mostly Spain, but in the case of Brazil, Portugal, as opposed to the English. I mean, that, makes, that, that serves to explain a lot, I think. So what I think is fascinating about Brazil is that it's just another case of that, where you have a political structure that, in many cases, attempts to model itself after the United States, but plays out differently based on different cultural aspects and backgrounds of its people. You know, as you them using quotas, for example, as as opposed to our shunning quotas, um, um, as you know, one amongst many. The, the, their idea of being a racial democracy, uh, at the same time that we, in the South at least, had strict segregation laws. You know, in Brazil, tr traditionally they were they were very integrated racially. But that didn't take that didn't mean that they. Didn't, they were fooling themselves to think that that mean that racism didn't exist. It still existed. 
and it just played out differently. Um, what was your impression of uh, Brazil's uh, perception of America and Americans? Like, how do they, how do they treat you, and how did you, uh, how do you think? <laughs> they well, I found that Brazilians uh, could e could distinguish between U.S. U.S. government and its policies and the U.S. people. And uh, me being an American, they didn't necessarily hold my government against me, which was nice. At the same time. Uh, I found that they could be, they could be very irritated with the U.S. government. After all, uh, after 9/11, of course, uh, the United States was making it very difficult for Brazilians to visit the United States. To uh, very, very strict in who got a visa and who didn't. And uh, the Brazilians reacted to that, as you, I guess, you might expect. They they started to make it difficult for Americans to get visas to go to Brazil. And I had to get, I had to get fingerprinted in order to, w when I got off the plane. Uh, I guess lest I be a terrorist coming from the United States. You know, in many ways, they were just doing it because that's what we were doing to them. And, and their policy was in an essence to express their irritation. I do remember a, a joke that they had, uh, you know, when we, I mean, we've been, we've tended to look down on much of South America, Central America, and, uh, and the, call them banana republics, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, popular dictatorships, and not really practicing, uh, and not being as successful at practicing democracy as we have been. You know, we could refer to the, the, the period of the, of the military coups that existed, uh, putting military, uh, uh, generals in, in, as in the presidency in the 1970s and 80s, for example. Um, but their response was, uh, sure, the United States hasn't had to worry about any coup d'etats because they haven't had an American embassy that funded them. Uh, basically, they, they accused the United States of funding a lot of the military coup, coups in Central America. And the fact that uh, uh, there's no foreign power that funds coups in the United States. Well, of course, that's why we don't have any coups here. So that was their explanation for our, our so-called uh, uh, being immune to that sort of thing. But uh, uh, they have found that the Americans' uh, big brother approach to the Western Hemisphere has been very heavy-handed and uh, traditionally and has, uh, and in many cases, served to undermine democracy. Uh, in Central and South America, um, despite our, uh, you know, profession of it and, and attempting to export it. Any other questions? <laughs> Uh, you mentioned that Brazil has been self-sufficient with oil for a long time. Has there been any talk of them joining um, like OPEC or any kind of price-controlling cartel? Uh, no, no, it's a good question. Um, you know, a lot of oil-producing countries have not joined mm -hmm. OPEC. I mean, Russia is a major oil exporter. They have not joined OPEC. Um, then again, uh, there, Venezuela in South America is a state that belongs to OPEC, so obviously they're there's at least one state in South America that has joined o OPEC, but I, the Brazilians, I do not think, uh, plan to join. Um, and I haven't heard any talk to that, to that uh, effect of them joining. Um, Norway exports oil. They're not uh, a member of OPEC. The United States ex exports a lot of oil. We're not members of OPEC. Well, if there's no other questions, I certainly thank you for coming. Great questions, everybody. Thank you. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of the uh, conference this week.